Howdy, and good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. There's been so much change since February 14th when we started Invent for the Planet, and we're here to celebrate today about the five teams that have elected to participate in this video competition for the final winner for Invent for the Planet. My name is Rodney Bame. I'm with Texas A&M University, and we're coming to you live from Texas A&M University. You know, in February 14th, we were just starting to hear about the coronavirus. The, w, the World Health Organization had just renamed it to become COVID-19. We had no idea what this was going on. All of us were able to be together, and we didn't even think about social distancing at that time. However, we knew that something was looming in the background and we were trying to figure out what this all meant. Now everything is virtual. All of us have to be socially distanced apart. All of us now are wearing masks to protect each other and to try to come together as this global pandemic has taken a grip on the earth. We want to celebrate our frontline workers, all the healthcare workers, the medical staff, the disaster relief, um, agencies and everyone who is working to find a vaccination. In fact, many of the universities that we have today are working on COVID-19 vaccine so that we can retake our world. We're here to celebrate. We're here to celebrate past accomplishments and things that people are going to be doing in the future. On February 14th, almost 40 universities across the globe participated in Invent for the Planet. There were over 800 students engaged. And for one weekend, there were no borders. There was no politics. There was no barriers. For one weekend, there were only students trying to find solutions to global, global problems. And the sun for that weekend never set on innovation. The process that everybody went through is each university had their own local event. And that university then chose a winner for that local event. Each of those winners then submitted their presentation in a video, and it was judged by a group of almost 30 different judges globally to try to understand and select the top six winners. The intention was to invite the top six winners to Texas A&M University for the final celebration and final competition. COVID-19 had other plans. So what did we do? What we always do, we adapt. Now we're going virtual. Today, we have the top five teams here to compete today. There are teams from McCarra University, from Texas A&M University, from the combined University of Centro Federal de Education Tecnologica and University Federal do Rio de Janeiro, and James Madison University, and from New Mexico State University. Each one of these teams will be shown a 10 minute video of their presentation. Before that, you're going to get a one to two minute video of an introduction to their university so that you can understand the facilities and the staff and the educational characteristics that are going at each one of the universities. After that, each of the teams will be given five minutes to answer questions by judges. I will moderate those questions. Judges, if you will, please be sure to put your questions in the Q&A section according to the Zoom webinar, and I will then ask the questions of the students. The way we'll do this is while your university presentation is being presented, we will promote you to panelists. And after your promotion to panelists and after your video has played, we'll ask you to turn on your video camera so that we can see you as we ask the questions. I'll then ask you the questions and you'll respond. And then after the five minutes of question and answer period, then we'll take you back to the participants and ask you to turn off your video camera. And this will cycle through to each one of the other universities as they go on. If you don't have a video camera, that's fine. Just please make sure that you are on audio 
and unmute yourself as well as turn on your video camera. We do hope that we can see you as we're participating. We look forward to not only seeing your presentations, but also we look forward to seeing and hearing the answers to your questions. We will have um, judges, again, there are seven different judges. They are Dr. Abakgaba, Alan Brewer, Professor Marcelo de uh, Rodriguez de Campos, Justin Hernandez, Dr. Gabe Garcia, and Ms. Laura Bergstoff from um, Airbus and Isabella Mascarenas from um, RS Components. They are two of our partners in the Invent for the Planet activity. We wanted to let you know also that Invent for the Planet is going to go on as well in 2021. We'll be announcing the dates and announcing the time frame and announcing the schedules soon. We hope all of you participate in this as it's going to be a global event again. And as you can imagine, we're going to have some really interesting problems to try to solve as we continue to battle against COVID-19 and retake our world. As soon as the judges and all of the videos are complete and the judging is completing, we'll be playing a video recapping some of the previous Invent for the Planet uh, competitions. We will then compile the scores and then we'll come back after about 10 minutes and announce the winners. The first place winning team will receive $5,000. The second place winning team will receive $3,000. And the third place winning team will receive $2,000. We'll be working with you to get this money to you individually. So please pay attention to emails and give us the information that we need so that we can efficiently process these payments. Again, thank you so much for all that you have done for the competition, for Invent for the Planet. Thank you for all of your flexibility and as we work through the details of making this happen. Thank you for everything that you have done and let's now start the competition. Good luck to all, and we'll get started. Thank you. The year 1922 laid down a stone mark for this dream of success. The start of a technical school that has grown beyond leaps and bounds into the great Makerere. Makere University, now boasts of a population of over 40,000 students, making her one of the largest universities on the continent. Ranked third as the top prestigious university on the African continent, Makere provides the best programs that have nurtured many influential and powerful figures impacting the world. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dennis Sechimbi from Makere University in Uganda. I hope everyone is keeping safe. I am part of Higher Bioplastics, a group of three looking to eliminate single-use oil-dry plastics, and we are happy to be part of the virtual finals of IFTP 2020. Before all this, our lives were different. Before the pandemic and the lockdown started, we lived a different consumer lifestyle. We ate out, had takeaway for meals, went for parties, served food and disposable plates, and different plastic materials. And all this would throw away immediately after use and never really cared where it ended up. We in Uganda, most urban centers have centralized markets where most low and middle income people access fast foods in form of takeaways. This can be compared to how most people in the US can access cheap takeaway meals at McDonald's or KFC, but this is not in a roof or a building. The markets appear serving fast foods from about 4 p.m. to midnight on a daily and most of these vendors sell their food in plastic packaging. Let me tell you about these plastics we use. They are inexpensive, lightweight, and easy to make. These properties make it ideal for packaging globally. Even our vendors in Kampala use them. In 2015, alone, as you can see in the illustration, global plastic production was up to 400 million tons. 
Now from this, we can see that about 86% of the plastic we use is disposed and littered as waste. 14% is recycled and then the lambing 32% leaks into the environment. Oftentimes, this plastic contains toxic chemicals that are detrimental to both the environment and to humans, but it can lead to health complications. How do we solve this? As higher bioplastics, we decided to use one problem to solve another. But before we get there, this picture was taken a few years back from Lake Victoria and shows a ferry surrounded by water hyacinth with no side of the lake but only a green cover. Water hyacinth is a free floating plant whose growth is linked to accumulation of nutrients in fresh water sources. These nutrients end up in the water through water runoff from land where fertilizers have been applied and other forms of water pollution. This weed is fast growing and it has been observed to grow at a rate of about five meters per day in heavily polluted waters, which is about 70.5 tons per hectare per day. This has led to increased coverage across different freshwater sources in the world, as you can see in the map on the slide. But it has only been utilized in low value applications like crafts and animal feed, but generally viewed as a hazard. Now, by blocking waterways in Uganda, it has cost fishermen an additional 2,200 fuel annually and about 83,000 US dollars worth of fishing gear. Losses of about 1.8 million US dollars were estimated due to inaccessible landing sites. And also pests that can spread diseases like malaria, growing the mud formed by this weed, which affects human populations in those areas. The dead shoots also decompose and affect the water quality, leading to an increased cost of treatment before supply to the people. Another interesting fact we found is that in Sub-Saharan Africa, more than 50% of the world's cassava is produced, and about 40 countries growing it as a subsistence crop. The crop, however, has been greatly undervalued, with low prices as low as $0.04 per kilogram. Hence, exporting countries like Thailand opted to reduce their production and exports. There have been attempts to increase its value through use as an additive in animal feed. However, no significant value has been marked. What then have we decided as higher bioplastics? Higher bioplastics has created a biodegradable packaging material using water hyacinth feedstock, cassava starch as binder, and glycerol as plasticizer. The goal is to replace existing petroleum derived disposable packaging used by food vendors, not only in Kampala, but in Africa at large. At the end of its life, it can be transformed into useful products that have less harm to the environment. Now, water hyacinth has an average of about 11.5 crude fiber, and this is the source of the filler material and reinforcement in our biocomposites. The hyacinth yields rigid brittle fiber, therefore to improve the flexibility and reduce bitterness, we added glycerol as a pesticide. The product requires improved hydrophobicity to protect it against moisture, so we consider these wax layer as a protective biodegradable coating. We include vinegar since it's observed to offer protection against fungus. So the mixture can be heat compressed in a mold, to form our biodegradable packaging. Now, our feedstock is an invasive plant and doesn't compete for arable land with food crops, unlike previously used bioplastics. Producing a bio-based biodegradable plastic is a safer option compared to the petroleum-derived plastics whose production has more carbon emissions and that makes it less environmentally friendly. Now, economically, we looked at the unit price of our product against the price of common packaging material used on the market by plastic vendors who can be the beach head market. Now clearly our slightly exceeds the price of what's on the market, but from projections and economies of scale can help bring down the cost of our biodegradable packaging to about $0.1, which is comparable to existing products. Now, if a tool hyacinth is exhausted due to high harvesting rates, we idealize the concept of hyacinth farmers who grow hyacinth in urban and tower gardens to avoid competition with arable land. So we consider that a farmer spends about $11 for a nine square meter farm yielding about 2,000 shoots per fortnight based on the growth rate we presented earlier. And we pay off about $21 for this, making it more profitable for the farmer. Most importantly, in the rate of the production cost breakdown based on our estimates in the first and second prototyping trials. And all this leads to a production cost of about 0 0.134 for the packaging material. A circular economy is based on three principles. Regenerating natural systems, keeping products and materials in use, design out waste and pollution. So our circular economic model looks at closing the loop by providing low cost compost to cassava farmers from our waste to improve their yields, 
And also, we look at waste packaging turning to briquettes as an energy source. Since about 25.4 million of the families rely on charcoal in Uganda, which is sourced from trees, and this is quite dangerous. So these briquettes can become an alternative source of fuel to the Ugandans, since our packaging material can be turned into these briquettes. Adopting our product cuts across environmental, social, and economic boundaries in terms of impact. There will be significant reduction in pollution once you use bioplastics and harvesting. Hyacinth will improve the livelihood of communities that depend on these water bodies. And cassava, which was formerly undervalued, will be much more valued in our case. Let me draw you to the most important part of this. Our prototyping, we carried out an assessment of vendors in one day their market just in the neighborhood of our university market and served students. We were able to carry out a survey to establish what packaging material is used and the average number of plants they attain. From this, we found that the market serves most important university students, about 2,400 of them, and it has about 100 fast food vendors. They depend on the aluminum foil and polythene bulk for packaging, and this is what we're looking to replace. So we realized that it's a centralized community, and we've been able to build a model that can ease collection of the waste in such a centralized community. We strategically placed customized bins at the halls of the residence where university community can effectively dispose of the biopackaging material as waste for higher bioplastics to access for composting in a composting facility. Countries like Uganda don't have well streamlined collection systems and facilities, so this is the motivation for building a model in a centralized community. We were able to develop sheets using our proposed material using locally available equipment and rudimentary methods where well, we do not have a heating and even heating process, hence that dark shed in the picture. But since bioplastics is aligned with composting, we use these sheets to test for its compostability using different methods, rectangular window, inverse of composting and aerated static tile to assess which yields the best quality of compost eventually. Now to scale up our model we shall be quite challenged in various ways and we shall require a centralized community to easily and safely collect waste and ensure it ends up in a right for composting facility. There's quite a limited knowledge on the potential of bioplastics and this can hinder adoption of our product. It can be a very good substitute to these oil derived single use plastics. And there's indeed limited supporting policy to this. But however, this Uganda's vision for 2040, which calls for a green economy for sustainable development, is key in our adoption of this product. So it will give innovations like bioplastics an opportunity to emerge and go into wide scale application while tackling the biggest environmental scourge of our time. Now, this is the team that we have worked with through the IOTP program to the very end and we made it to the finals. It's Sachin Pigonis, the presenter, Mark Mustinguzi, and Kuzera Pike. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. Thank you so very much, IO Bioplastics. What we'd like to do now is to give an opportunity for the judges to ask questions. If you would, please type them in the question and answer section, and we will provide those answers. Also, I'm going to ask the team member from McCarra University to turn on their video, and that way we can see you and you can join us. Judges, I know we ask you to do a lot of things right now, both scoring as well as asking any questions. At this point in time, I don't have any questions yet. I request the uh, allow Sisiki, okay. how are you? All right, I do have one question. Have you looked at any environmental groups to partner with? Um, yes, uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes, so for this, we did find out that there's a group, the Lake Victoria Environment Management Program, which 
caters for the management of the lake, which has been greatly affected by water hyacinth. And this is a group to partner with, of said partner with, such that we can be able to access this hyacinth and try to monitor and see the impact of us harvesting this hyacinth environmentally and also socially, to say. Um, we've also looked at the Kampala Capital City Authority, which has been in charge of collecting the waste within the city. And that's a, a partner for us, since they are the ones in charge of man managing the landfill and also the composting facilities around the city. Okay, thank you so much. Here's so, the next question. Is this mix used any other where, any other place? Pardon? Is the mix that you're proposing to be used for this plastic used any place else? Yes, so we were able to benchmark from a company called BioLutions, but BioLutions was using a different feedstock. But then the process of preparation does apply for different uh, organic feedstock. So we wanted to apply that same process for the water housing, and it is able to give us that yield of the plastic that we were able to achieve in our preparation. Okay, great. Another question. I'm not quite clear on how you take the hyacinth and create the sustainable packaging. Can you explain that a bit more, please? Yes, so basically what happens is hyacinth is a plant that is composed of several fibers. It, it has a lot of fiber content, sorry. So we thresh that fiber and it turns into very small particles at almost nanoscale um, using a thresher. And then from that, you're able to get those fine particles where you can have a binder such that once you compress it under heat compression, that mixture is able to give you um, a product which is the plastic at that point. So this is a bioplastic material yielded from the water housing. Okay, great. Thank you very much. The next question is what variation on the raw components did you explore? Either substitutes or percentage wise? Yes, for, for our pilot, uh, for our prototype, we looked at a mixture of 55% of the feedstock, which is the water hyacinth, giving us the fiber, and then the 45% giving being the binder to achieve the product that we're able to achieve. Okay. Another question is, what other alternatives did you consider? Yes, um, so on that we were able to analyze and discover that you can work with this um, without the binder if we're able to achieve high water hyacinth in very small particles after threshing. We realize that once we get rid of the binder, because having a binder sometimes may not be uh, the easiest of options, so if we're able to achieve very small particles, we can work without the binder and the compress and those particles will have self-binding properties to enable us to have uh, the plastic, the bioplastic that we, we are producing. So that was the other option we looked at, eliminating the binder to sort of reduce um, the material intake of our product. So it will be water hyacinth feedstock alone. Okay, beautiful. Another question. Did you make a prototype? If so, how well did it perform? Yes, sir. thank you. So on that, from the slides, you're able to see uh, a, a small process that we prepared using rudimentary methods. And uh, we did discover along the way, we're trying to test for compostability much after because bioplastics are challenged with the issue of compostability. And it was observed that it's able to achieve, uh, to achieve compost as we intend, which is good for the bioplastic. Then in terms of product strength, um, we were able to compare it's, it, the strength requirements are not as high as existing plastic materials, but they are um, sufficient to be used in applications like food packaging, 
which was the intention for this uh, mid statement. And thank you so much for participating. I know that this was difficult for you to be able to change the time zones and uh, from Africa, we really appreciate the person's participation. Again, this is Haya Bioplastic from McKeer University. Thank you very much. We're now going to move into a different team and uh, your host here made a huge mistake in not introducing the university and the team name. So we're going to correct that for the rest of the time. Uh, this is going to be Texas A&M University and the team name is Ecotory. Hi, my name is Emily Gonzalez, and I'm a biomedical engineer, class of 2020. Howdy, my name is Teresa Valdez, and I'm a senior computer engineering major. My name is Ryu Q. I'm a senior computer engineering major. Howdy, my name is Sven Loza, and I'm a junior mechanical engineering major. Howdy, my name is Noble Knight Gutierrez, and I'm a junior in mechanical engineering. Howdy, I'm Claire and I'm a mechanical engineering PhD student, and we are Ikutari. 10 billion pounds. 10 billion pounds of waste were produced in 2016 by airline passengers, which will nearly double by 2030. Do you know what happens to your waste once you reach your destination? <laughs> It is accumulated in landfills or incinerated, both of which waste resources and contribute to climate change. Over 73% of airline waste stems directly from excess food and packaging materials simply because airlines are unable to gauge passengers' needs prior to the flight, resulting in overstocking. What if we told you that we could significantly reduce this amount of waste? Welcome to Ecotory, the world's first sustainable inventory system that allows passengers to directly participate in minimizing in-flight waste. Our environmentally conscious application programming interface allows passengers to exchange unwanted meals or amenity kits for airline miles. This provides individualized experiences for each passenger while also encouraging waste reduction. Ecotory drastically reduces the weight on board the aircraft, which saves millions of dollars in fuel consumption. Our system offers a webhook that allows airline carriers to seamlessly integrate their existing database systems with our API. Take flight with Ecotory and enjoy a sustainable inventory. The problem we are solving is the excessive waste produced by airline passengers. This is a problem because it takes up too much space on airplanes, which in turn increases fuel costs, and in order for it to be decomposed, it contributes to global warming. We are also focusing on international flights and long domestic flights, where the passengers usually have a lot of options when it comes to meals, blankets, and amenity kits. This table relates the amount of waste from airlines to the amount of carbon dioxide emissions produced from it. In 2016, it was calculated that 10 billion pounds of waste were produced, and this resulted in almost 20 billion pounds of carbon dioxide emissions. These numbers are expected to double by the year 2030 if no actions are taken. 
The waste we are focusing on comes mostly from food, paper, and plastic wrappings. Currently, airlines use statistical data to provide them with a set number of meals and amenities, such as headphones and blankets, that they will bring on a flight for a certain number of people. This is a problem though, because not every passenger will want what is packed for them, producing excessive and wasted product. These are the five design requirements we use to optimize our design. Reduce the airline waste by a minimum of 30%, does not depend on the changing of local or federal laws, does not increase a workload for flight attendants, must be at a minimum of net zero cost to the airline, must be implementable to more than one carrier. Much like our first two ideas, there are a lot of designs out there that allow the airline to be eco-friendly, but these solution costs changes to the structure of the aircraft and the flight attendants' routines. Our final product allows the airline to be proactive and reduce the waste from the source. Introducing Ecotory. Our design is an application programming interface that plugs into the individual airline databases and reduces the waste of the aircraft by asking the customer preferences on the amenities provided throughout the flight. Q will show you how this API works. Let's launch the Ecotory application. First thing that appears is the home page. I'm going to start with the food selection. Here's a pop-up introducing me to the reward opportunity. Before we start the selection, we'll be given the information of how many meals are provided on the flight. My flight is providing two meals this time. And to be eco-friendly, I only want to order one meal. As a result, we can see I get 100 bonus miles. I'm a vegetarian, so I have dietary restriction. I will select a vegetarian. Now, we can see different types of vegetarian options are available to me. I select Asian vegetarian. Next, there are different kinds of beverage I can choose. I'm going to order tomato juice. Here's another pop-up reminding me about the reward opportunity. Then I get to choose what amenities I want during the flight. I only need a blanket for this trip. Now I get to review all the items I've selected. This is great. By placing all this request, I'm rewarded 200 bonus miles. Having a customer place their request ahead of the time through the API can replace statistical assumptions with the actual data to assess the need. This helps passenger carrier pack less unnecessary item on the flight and avoid overloading the plane. All of this can reduce the final waste to be treated afterward. Our API is designed to hook seamlessly into these airline databases. By pulling ticketing information and flight information, we can generate a template for all the amenities offered on the flight, which will then be sent to the passengers. After the passengers fill out the form, it will go into the airline's statistical database to improve the airline's analysis of passengers. 24 hours before the flight, the form will be uploaded to the manifest database to ensure your preferences make it on board. Flying is scary because it is the one place where you're thousands of feet above the earth in a metal canister where you have no control over what's going to happen to you. Giving customers even a little more say over their flight experience goes a long way, and that's exactly what Ecotory does. At Ecotory, we help airlines make customers feel like a member of the green team. Even small reductions to items brought onto the plane can lead to massive savings in food, fuel, and environmental costs. United Airlines estimated that they could save $300,000 a year by reducing the weight of each in-flight magazine by one ounce. And of course, we can't forget about American Airlines' $40,000 olive. But we aren't just a pretty interface. We also plan on handling the data analysis to help airlines better understand which amenities to provide customers and prevent overstocking on flights. As we mentioned, a large part of the Equatory business model is providing customer incentives. If a passenger chooses to forgo certain products, such as a meal or amenities like headphones, they're rewarded with airline miles. This gives the customer the choice to minimize waste and reduce their carbon footprint. We spoke with a Southwest business consultant and they supported the revolutionary idea of rewarding reduction of waste with airline miles. It costs airlines fractions of a cent to offer airline mile rewards each mile flown, which provides for a mutually beneficial rewards program. In addition, through interviews with flight attendants, we have found that customers report not getting the meal they prefer. With Equatory, we will allow for the customer to be satisfied with as many aspects of the flight as possible, including always receiving the meal of their preference. Gone would be the days of hearing the words, sorry, we're out of chicken. For our financial impact, we're going to be engaging in a contract with airlines where we would charge them an annual subscription fee. The fee is based on the distribution of our efforts and services, such as data analytics. 
we will target large international airlines, such as United, because they produce the most in-flight waste globally. Now, let's emphasize our project innovations. First, this idea can be implemented into any airline database. Second, we notice that pre-selection services, especially regarding amenities, are extremely limited or not offered at all in the market. Third, the role of the passengers is reaching a unique level of control in their traveling experience. Finally, we will considerably cut down on excessive waste working directly on the source of waste production and use. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, international travel is of great concern. Airlines are going to be looking for ways to brand themselves in a new light and make a positive impact. Ecotari is in a perfect position to contribute to this impact by saving airlines money in a crucial time and enhancing customer experiences in an age where environmental awareness is at an all-time high. We have future directions we would like to discuss as well. This project could explore a more educational manner such as providing health information about the destination or giving suggestions on how to pack lighter. For example, if a customer is going to settle in a hotel, shampoo bottle may be provided and therefore it will be unnecessary to bring your own. Moreover, we would like to ask the passenger's opinion to implement more features. Last but not the least, our API could be adapted beyond airlines to plug into other industries like hotel and train services. Thank you for your attention. Now, take flight with Ecotory and enjoy a sustainable inventory. Thank you so much, Ecotory. As we ask you to turn on your video, and I'm gonna give the judges a few minutes to compose their questions. I'd like to also remind the judges to please submit your scoring as things are going on. So each one of the panelists now, if you will now open up your bit audio and video so that we can ask your questions and we will allow you to um, allow you to see each other. Outstanding. Thank you very much. And I'll see you. All right. Here is your first question. What design alternatives did you consider? Uh, Teresa, can you expand on that? So we looked into different um, solutions when looking into this. Um, we, like, like we mentioned, we had three different design requirements. We made sure we did it, um, change the, the, the way that the air, the air, the stewards worked. So we would make sure that was our main priority to where it didn't add any extra time to what they had to do. Um, many of the ideas we looked into um, didn't really allow that. So that's why we went ahead and went with these, um, which is where we went with the inventory problem. Okay, great. Here's your next question. Have you discussed this with any of the airlines? Uh, Q, do you want to expand on that? We've done uh, several interviews. Uh... Yes, so we've done, we've been doing customer interviews with different airlines. And so far we've conducted interviews with American Airlines, United, uh, Southwest and JetBlue's airlines, and we've get um, we've conducted the interviews, and then we got more of idea how our products can be used uh, in inter airlines um, systems, and that's been really helpful for us to see how is the catering companies um, is come in place in um, our ideas and our solution. We've also uh, had an interview with uh, Southwest Business Consultant, as I mentioned in, in the in the video, and he supported the idea of re putting a rewards program in there or some kind of incentive system. Because a lot of the other ideas that we also looked into uh, would require changes to the aircraft architecture and would didn't provide an incentive system to the airlines where they would make actually you know it would incur a cost to the airlines. So we wanted a, a program that would actually uh, let them see profits um, from in implementing Equatory. Okay, let me 
expand on that question. Have you done any cost analysis? For example, cost for creating the software solution, implementing, and advertising to encourage uptake from the airlines. Yeah, so the currently the, the primary issue with software is in the development phase. We're still looking at exactly what functionalities we want to roll in. But at the same time, that's one of our biggest benefits. We acknowledge with the COVID-19 crisis that a lot of airlines um, are a little cash strapped right now. They're maybe not looking into a full-time development, which is an advantage for us because I'm, I'm sure a question is, why don't the airlines go and develop it themselves? That would require them to sink the resources in and develop an entire system from ground up, whereas we can split the cost over multiple airlines and also roll out different features as uh, we continue with the development schedule. Uh, we, we looked at, um, when we were talking with, uh, some of the, uh, people, with uh, some of the airline officials that we were interviewing, we saw that they really like the idea of the cost savings through amenities and foods and other uh, other items that passengers can opt out of. But they were even more excited about the fact that this gives them another avenue to kind of connect with the customer on. One of the ideas of feedback we get is, could this app help perhaps um, people who travel pack better? For example, we noticed that you're packing to these locations. These are some items that you should bring, and these are some items you, you could probably leave. If you're going into a hotel, you probably don't need to bring your own shampoo. Hotel will provide it. So it's items like that that um, are further parts of expansion that we can roll out as future software packages, which will help us keep the price at a level that the airlines can afford and will be lucrative at them. Uh, for them because they can implement one cost saving measure, reap the benefits of that before they move on and implement the second or third tiers of uh, solutions that we would provide them. So that's kind of the analysis we've done. Uh, in the presentation you saw, we had a brief cost breakdown of where based on some of our experience that we have talking with IT professionals, where we see um, our primary costs being um, from a percentage breakdown. Quick question here, answer. Unused food and blankets and headphones don't necessarily go to waste. Do you have any number of expected waste reduction? So um, part of the idea of waste is one, the food, food is generally wasted. But like, uh, like the question is, they're absolutely right. Blankets and unused headphones don't go to waste, but they generate to um, the extra um, clogging, so to speak, of the plane, where you have excess items on the plane that contribute to the weight of the plane, while minuscule over time and over thousands of flight will add up to a larger amount. So the idea is to streamline the process, and that's pulling from multiple sources. We're not just looking at one source, we're looking at the plane as a whole. And based off of all the cost savings we can get on the plane as a whole, we see it becoming a substantial amount. So yes, saving one blanket isn't going to provide that much of financial upside, but one blanket on every single flight not making it onto the plane and saving those fuel savings is going to lead up to a larger upside, um, especially when combined with other cost saving measures on the plane. Okay, Eager Tori, thank you so much for your presentation, your hard work, and for answering the questions. We'll be moving on to the next one in a few minutes. However, we're going to give our judges just a few minutes to uh, finish scoring and to go ahead and submit their scores. So we'll go ahead and drop this, the videos from the Ecotory, move into the uh, resting video. We'll wait about a minute, and then we'll go into the next uh, team. The next team is going to be the combined team from uh, Central Federal de Education Tecnologica and Universidad Federal do Rio de Janeiro, and the team name is Coraz. So we'll wait just a minute and give our judges an opportunity to score and submit their scores. And again, remind you judges, please submit your scores and we will get started in just about a minute.
So here we have our water, our microplastic, the magnetite, and the two magnets that we use to extract the microplastic. So first we add the microplastic and the magnetite. Stir it. And like so, we can use our magnets to capture the magnetite along with the microplastics. So our idea is to use this uh, magnetite property to create a filter and filter the and reduce the presence of microplastics into the ocean. We have the uh, five main goals with this filter. It needs to filter all the micro, uh, all size of microplastics ranging from one millimeter to five micrometers. It needs to be a low cost filter, user friendly, mass produced, and recyclable. It needs to be mass produced because there is a lot of microplastics in the ocean and we want to remove them. And it needs to be recyclable because it doesn't make any sense to remove the microplastics and just throw more plastic on it. So we focus on three scales for the ideas, the macro, meso, and micro scales. So our, our idea for the micro, macro scale was to use filters and attach filters on these filters to trap the microplastics uh, as they float through the ocean. Our meso solution was to work with sewage treatment plants and implement uh, the, fil the filters into the into, into the into their these plants. However, we learned that 85% of the microplastics in the oceans are microfibers. That's is microplastics coming from clothes, and 50% of house uh, household Old microplastics comes from our washing machine. So we decided to focus on the micro, micro scale and put these fil this magnetite filters into our washing machines to filter the microplastics in the source.
The solution proposed by this is the multi-rate filter and its microflash capture system. It will store microflash particles on a scale of 1 mm to 5 micrometers. It will have the capacity to filter around 300,000 particles per field. The filter can be easily removed by its user and we will have a system to retrieve the used filter and to recycle the product. As stated, it can only be removed by its manufacturer in order to avoid cases in which the citizen removes and increases the filter or disposes of eating the common waste. It's planned cost is around $10 to $15. For this is our final sign up for type. So here we have the, the water. This is the part that attached to your machine or the sink. The water goes in this way and passes through the water diffuser and gets to the mat, into the air diffuser. So here, this is how it works. This is the water flow. So we have here the water with a lot of microplastic particles and passes through the net. And the large particle, the, 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 large, the larger size particles get attached to the net. And you have some the, the releasing of some of the magnetized here, and the smaller, the smaller size microplastic, the microplastic, the best the net, and they all get attached to each other by uh, they get absorbed. The magnetite absorbs the microplastic, and they are attracted by the magnets here. So you have the water, the the water flow is going without the microplastic. So after it passes to the moisture filter here. It goes to the gross area and we have the, the safety magnets here just in case some particles get released to the gross area and this is that. So with this design, we made this compact. And I'll make you a little demonstration, a little explanation of each one of these parts. So here we have the prototype. These are the magnets to recover any particle of magnetite that we just that just got released in the water. This is the water diffuser. This is the filter, the multi-layered filter without the magnetite. The multi-layered much -layered filter with the magnetite, we can see that it has uh, a mesh covering it. The base of the filter over there. This is the, the filter web, so the filter goes inside of it. And we have here the pearls area, so the water, the, the water flux don't get stuck here. And these are the covers of the filter or the siphon lead, the siphon lead and the siphon base. base. So we have the web, the filter goes inside of it, the diffuser, the water diffuser goes inside of it. The magnets go here. The web goes on the siphon. And we have the lead. So here we have the water entrance and exit. So we can conclude that we were able to make a viable product. It satisfies all their demands, so we will be able to, to design a prototype that meets all the five requirements. It has a low cost, it is recyclable, and here we can go between two markets. The first one is the private consumer. So, by, by designing a low cost product, we ensure that this market here is satisfied. The second one, there are companies. So, once that our product, product not even removed, the microplastics in the, in the environment, but also is recyclable, we can ensure a uh, green scan. Switch to me.
Thank you, Team Correas. We're going to be asking you to unmute and turn on your video so that we can answer questions. All right, Larissa and Samuel, if you could. There we go, Samuel. All right, and the judges are asking questions. Here we go. First question, how do you know all the magnetite has been recovered? Is it recyclable, reusable? And how are microplastics disposed of these as they're removed from the magnetite? Uh, yeah, first, uh, yes, magnetite is, uh, is recyclable. It's actually a uh, waste from industrial products from the, the metallurgical industry. So we can, we can recover the magnetite. And we are sure that it doesn't get released because we have two, magnet, two magnets. We have the first one on the top, right after the, the siphon lead. So it attaches the largest part. But we have a second one that it's a safe, a, a safe yeah, sort of a safe magnet that gets on the base of the siphon. So if we have any particle that gets released that's not stuck on the net and it's not stuck on the first magnet, get uh, attached to the second magnet of the base. Yeah, if you see our, our design, we have a kind of siphon. So in, the particles are trapped on the siphon, or at least the, cur the current gets a little bit slower, and then the part captured by the safety magnet gets out. Okay, next question. How is the filtered and collected plastic output? How's it collected? So, uh, so we have two main uh, properties of the of the filter. One is the physical property itself of the mesh of the of the iron oxide. The second one is the magnetic uh, type. So, uh, the particle will get will adhere to the uh, uh, the ferrite. Uh, and then we will be dragged to the and collect by the magnets. So with this, we can get a huge range of uh, sizes to filter it. We can go from one millimeter to 0.5 micrometers. So it's a huge hand, range of uh, particles that we can filter this way. Uh, this is almost relatable to a 95 masks. Uh, here we need magnets, but N95 masks use actually uh, electrostatic, but it's the same concept of capturing big and small particles. Okay, great. The next question is, have you compared the amount of microplastic ex exiting the washing machine with and without the filter? There are experiments uh, that say that this kind of we can filter almost nine, 90 to 95% of the microplastic. Have you had a chance to use your prototype to check this out or have is it not been able to work yet? We haven't attached it to the, the washing machine but yeah we tested it on the, on the sink so we that prototype that we showed in the video you can see on the, on the video that the base it's a little bit dark Yes. Because we had some magnetites over there, some microplastics, and we passed it through the sink. So we, we tested the flow to, to check the pearls area. We tested everything, and the magnetite get st got stuck on the bottom. Okay, great. Here's another one. Very interesting solution. How would you go about scaling up our multiplying prototype to cover large swatches of the ocean? And how would it work in operation in the ocean? That's something. The, ocean. the mm -hmm. filter is it on the washing machine, so we could partner with a washing machine company uh, to implement the, the our product into their washing machines, and in the and when the consumer will buy a washing machine, he we can also have the. Uh, sell to the, the user as well uh, 
I would say, a subscription that we can then uh, have the refilling of our. Okay, so it's a subscription model where you'd be able to refill the filter device. Yeah, and One then last we question. will recycle it. Okay, perfect. One last question. What's the estimated cost of the divide? Yeah, uh, we had, it's, it's actually, it's the same, the same idea of a sink that I have today on the, on the, on your sink, uh, a, a siphon for the sink or a filter for the machine. So it's the average cost, it's between 10 and $15 for the customer because uh, magnetite, it's a really cheap product. It's just a uh, waste from metallurgical process. And the structure itself, we can reuse the, the siphon that we already use today in the sink. And we can reuse the same, the same idea, the same uh, structure for the machine filters. And I would just like to answer one question that was made here about the, the safety of the magnetite. Magnetite, it's a non-toxic metal. So if by any chance it gets released in the water, it's not, it's not a danger to the environment or to us in any way. But we have, that's why we have both magnets to ensure that we can collect the maximum or hopefully the whole amount of magnetite that gets released. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Team Correas. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for being right on time and thank you for a very innovative design. We're going to be moving on to the next team. And again, we're going to give the judges about a minute or two to be able to continue and finish their scoring. The next team will be uh, from James Madison University and it will be Team Walk A Lot. Again, we're gonna give the judges about a minute or so to continue and finish their judging. And then we'll show the James Madison University, followed by the team walk about, walk a lot, excuse me, video. Thank you very much. I chose JMU and their engineering program specifically because I was really interested in engineering all through high school and JMU's program is very open-ended and project-oriented which really intrigued me. We learn how to think like an engineer especially in the designing aspect. Here at Madison Engineering you have the ability to almost create the path that you want to go through it. Um, if you're interested in cars, we have vehicle tech electives. If you're interested in renewable energy, you can take our sustainability classes. So you have the ability to pave your way through your major and make it exactly what you want it to be. We get to really young, start working with real clients. Working on a project that you, you know the client that you're working for, it's extremely rewarding. You know that you're, you're doing something more than just learning from it, but you're also helping someone and hopefully making someone's life a little bit better. That's allowed me to understand as becoming an engineer how important it is to, to have those interactions and to understand, you know, what, what does the client want. You can do so much with engineering. So I feel like if you're a high school senior thinking about coming to JMU or even engineering, I say just try it. It's really fun and you get to work on projects, hands-on things, and really get to understand how everything in this world works. Are you tired of not having a personalized walking experience? Are your needs of safety, accessibility, and nature not being met? Well, introducing walk a -Law, a system that supports walking as a mode of transportation in urban environments by allowing for personalized navigation for handicap accessibility, better scenic views, sunlight or shade avoidance, and street lighting. Look at this handicap route. Look at those beautiful views. That doesn't look scary. Wow, it seems like this app would, would make a city smart by utilizing cell phones to reduce energy usage, decrease CO2 emissions, and improve quality of life. Don't walk a little, walk a lot.
Are you tired of not having a personalized walking experience? Are your needs of safety, accessibility, and nature not being met? Well, introducing walk a -Law, a system that supports walking as a mode of transportation in urban environments by allowing for personalized navigation for handicap accessibility, better scenic views, sunlight or shade avoidance, and street lighting. Look at this handicap route. Look at those beautiful views. That doesn't look scary. Wow, it seems like this app would, would make a city smart by utilizing cell phones to reduce energy usage, decrease CO2 emissions, and improve quality of life. Don't walk a little, walk a lot. Imagine you're leaving a business meeting and you're using your GPS to get home per usual. You're following your GPS and you're led into a dark, dark alley. You instantly feel uneasy as if something could just jump out and grab you. You regret not taking a taxi, even though your apartment is only two blocks away. Or imagine another scenario. You're living in a city you've been in for a couple of years and you feel like you can never get enough sunlight when walking around. Lastly, Imagine a scenario where you've twisted your ankle from playing baseball with some friends. You're now trying to get around town, but you realize that the navigation system isn't catering to your handicapped needs. Hi, my name is Pierre Mbala. I am a freshman engineering student. My name is Mark Magerchuk. I'm a junior engineering student. Hi, I'm Charles Sieber. I'm a junior engineering student. Hi, I'm Abby Maltese, and I'm a sophomore engineering student. We would like to introduce you a smart city solution to address these needs and more. So what are smart cities? Smart cities can encompass a lot of things in the modern world. Smart cities is a digital layer of our physical world that allows us to connect hundreds, thousands, or even millions of devices all into one network, into one system. Aspects of a smart city can include transportation, uh, public safety, sustainability, health, jobs, and education. Within a smart city, all these devices can be linked together and used for the better of society. In our society now, in, in our modern world, Everyone has a mobile device, a phone on them at all times. In the U.S., there's 1.2 mobile devices per person. In the past year, past two years alone, there's been a 238% increase in mobile technologies. In the U.S., there's 180 million plus mobile phones. Walking is the oldest form of method of transportation. It is the most energy efficient, the uh, least CO2 emitting, and the most space efficient. Remember the scenarios that Pierre brought up in the beginning. How can we use mobile technology to encourage uh, walking in an urban environment in a safe and sustainable way? Our proposed solution it capitalizes on the opportunity to make cities smarter using widely available crowdsourced information. There are 7 million cell phones in New York City alone. Each of these devices includes an array of sensors, potentially including barometers, ambient light sensors, and magnometers. On top of this, every device is equipped with GPS and mobile network communication. walk -a -Lot, our proposed solution, combines existing technology within phones and crowdsourcing user input to improve and encourage pedestrian transportation. So what is walk -a -Lot? Walk -a -Lot is a smart city solution for better pedestrian living. It is a navigation app that allows you to select route criteria for your walk, bike, or basically anything that you want to do on a sidewalk. Selective route criteria include accessibility, sun or shade avoidance, scenic route, street lighting, or the, just the shortest distance in time. There's crowdsourced user input, so when you're using the app, you can input if there's an obstruction, a construction, accessibility, bathrooms, or lighting. This will then go to all the other users. Now for the back end of this and where we would get the data for the app, for the navigation and mapping, we would use Google's API. For shade and sun calculations, we would use um, already existing 3D models of the cities. For all other data gathered, it would be through sensors in the phones of the users that are using the app. Now this can include vehicle traffic or air quality. So this is kind of a mock-up city that we've created just to show you an example of how this would work. So shown here are the handicapped accessible routes. This is where the street is lit. And this is where it is scenic. 
This is a 3D model of the mock-up city and it shows at different points in time where the sun is and how the shade is affected by that. The, on the left is an aerial view where you can see which routes are shaded or sunny at whatever time you select. Now these are four routes from point A to point B, just a sample example. And then these are kind of the overlay with the overlay of each preference. So routes one, two, and three all have street lighting and are handicap accessible and have some scenic aspect, where route four is just has street lighting and is handicap accessible. Now based on the sample preference given at time 2 p.m., if a person wants to get from point A to point B, route two would be the best for them because they have selected a shaded route, a scenic route, and a handicap accessible route. These preferences will be shown in some form of percentage of how much of the route is actually in accordance to the preference selected. So now we're gonna walk you through the walk around app. So this is what the main page will kind of look like. You can go ahead and press sign in. And once you're signed in, you see the location where you're at. And right now we're in this building. Maybe you want to say go to a soccer field. You want to press University Park field. And it gives you the shortest route. Say you want to change your preference to something that is scenic. Then it'll give you a new route that goes through the arboretum and do some grass fields. And while on your way, you can in, uh, input if there's construction, uh, restrooms you go by, stuff like that. So you want to change your preference to a lighted route. This will change your route to mostly street light. So you want both. This will give you another route that gives you both. Those are arboretum and streets. Once you get to your destination, your points are tallied up and your points will be shared with your friends. So if you go to the friend page, we can see all the friends you've added and how many points they gathered throughout using this app. We believe we can have a continuous user base because as days change, routes change. Life is unpredictable. So it may be nighttime, it may be daytime. So your preferences will always change, therefore your route will always change. In 2018, there was $147 billion in direct activity, meaning people spent $147 billion in purchasing through mobile networking and through mobile apps. There was $207 billion in indirect activity and $121 billion in induced activity. This is a key point, the induced activity, because both drivers and transit riders did not spend as much as walkers, indicating that walkers generate substantial income for retailers. We hope to add this feature, discover your city, where local businesses may be featured uh, while a user is going through their route. This will allow funding for our app and local businesses to thrive. To summarize, we believe our walkalot solution offers cities considerable benefits instantly by simply integrating mobile data into the lives of residents. These benefits include public safety, transportation, mobility and sustainability, health and well-being, and local businesses. We offer benefits to public safety by walking through lighter routes, transportation and mobility by decongesting city streets, sustainability by lowering CO2 emissions, health and well-being by encouraging users to exercise, and local businesses may thrive through our Discover Your City feature. By utilizing current mobile phones, our startup cost is significantly low and the project feasibility is high. Given all of our proposed features, there are currently no apps like this. Similar apps include Google Maps and Waze. However, however, these apps do not provide the features that Walkalot offers for pedestrian transportation. With all these features in mind that will improve health, transportation, environment, and individual walking experience, we are confident that this app can make a city smarter through reducing energy costs, improving sustainability, and the quality of life. With the recent outbreak of COVID-19, our team has began to think about how our app could help stop the disease from spreading. We believe that we could add an option where users could select to walk through low congested areas. Users could see if there are densely populated areas around them and plan the timing of their trip accordingly. This would allow the user to continue to social distance while walking from one location to the other. 
The option would also add to the public safety and health and well-being aspects of our app. Don't walk a little, walk, walk a lot. lot. <laughs> All right, team, thank you so much. I'm going to allow you to turn on your video and thank you and we'll get going with asking your questions. The judges have, have submitted some really interesting questions, so I'm looking forward to seeing the answers to them. Great presentation, by the way. All right, here we go. How and where will the up-to-date data you obtain and maintain? How are you going to do this? What's the cost for a typical year? And if crowdsourced, what incentive do you provide for your data? So to keep up-to-date data, we are planning on using crowdsourcing, as we said. Um, and we are not exactly sure how much this will cost to handle this data, but an incentive for the users to enter, um, enter data would be through the point system that you get and share with your friends. Okay, great. And, and th this is a, a survey, I mean, a similar question. How do you users contribute to the data to keep it up to date? How do they do that? Well, when they're walking and on a route, um, there's little buttons at the bottom of the screen that they can say, oh, there's construction here, and you can press a little button, and then that will go to us, and we can share that with other users. Um, and that goes for lighting, shade, um, and handicap accessible routes as well. Perfect. Did, what other design and alternatives did you consider? Um, well, given the prompt about how, how to help smart cities, um, we, we thought about a lot of different options, but none were exactly with the walking um, idea that we had. Um, but we ended up, so we thought about how to alter home systems and provide incentives to reduce waste and energy. But, um, Overall, this walking app will be much easier to implement because users already have their phones and you don't have to um, implement any more devices really to, to start the um, solution, to create the solution. So just because of the easy, easy, easiness of implementation, we decided to go with this solution. Okay, great. There's several questions here. Have you done any customer discovery, either through interviews or surveys or any kind of customer discovery like that to understand the need for this type of an app? So we have talked to some people who are very active, just try to be as active as possible and walk around like even our own campus. And when we brought up the idea of having a pedestrian specific walking app or navigation app, there was a lot of people asking the question, why isn't that even a thing yet? Why isn't Google focusing on this market or something else? And that is mostly because what we've been able to identify is just that the complexity and the problem of dealing with such, uh, I guess the things that on a pedestrian could encounter would be so different than what they're dealing with now. They haven't put forth the effort of doing it, but if we are able to bring in local businesses and everything, everything else into it, and uh, interact more with the local community also. It would have to be a more personal experience to every single city, but we could also bring a lot of businesses to these cities. And so we do believe that there's a market and there's definitely people who would use this app, at least who we've talked to and have surveyed. Another question, have you considered working with known apps like Waze and Google Maps instead of proposing a new app? Uh, maybe it might reduce your cost and use some of those APIs that already exist? Yes, we've definitely considered um, trying to work with Waze or Google Maps because they do have those APIs and similar technology with the, um, just the GPS and tracking system of everyone. Um, so yes, we definitely have considered that and it would definitely reduce cost. Great. Have you thought about how privacy might be handled with your app? I know I'm going to be entering in crowd data and adding some things to it. Uh, what protection have you made for considering for privacy? Um, similar to Waze, you won't be able to see what user entered what data 
where other users are, um, the, there won't be any kind of profile that shows up and shows a picture and name or anything like that. Um, so, and so that's how we will work with privacy. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're out of time, but thank you so much for your presentation and for participating and answering the questions. We'll be going on to the next presentation, which will be from New Mexico State University. The team name is Crustacean. Just as before, we're going to be give the judge uh, judges a few minutes to answer and input all of their scoring, and then we'll be moving on to the next presentation. I'll remind you that this is the final presentation. After that, we'll show a recap of other videos from previous Invent for the Planets while the judges complete their scoring, and then we'll come back to announce the winners. Thank you very much, and we'll start the next presentation in just about a minute. Hello, my name is Richard Dossetis. Hello, my name is Todd Troba. I'm Eric Lee. Hello, I'm Evan Saunders. And we are Crustacean. Measuring two times the size of Texas, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a growing plastic island floating in the Pacific Ocean. Due to currents in the ocean, tons of plastic waste are building up the garbage patch every single day. It is now estimated there is 16 times more trash in the ocean than originally thought. One of the most pervasive components of the garbage patch are microplastics, which are damaging delicate ecosystems. At Crustacean, no plastics will go to waste. With our system, we clean up the ocean trash gyre, save the marine ecosystem, and recycle the plastics up for materials. We have a three main part system, a solar powered water drone, a buoy with a magnetic ring and GPS signals. Attached to the buoy is a trash collecting bin that captures microplastics in the ocean, all autonomous in an efficient, synchronous system. Crustacean aims to help stop the ever worsening problem of microplastics in our oceans. These huge plastic gyres are out there in the ocean and we can collect them and turn them into reusable materials. Our end goal is to make a cleaner ocean and turn the microplastics that are harming our ocean into reusable materials. As Crustacean, we are ending the cycle of single-use plastics the nature of our effort is conservation. We designed a system to collect microplastics with the intention of establishing a profitable businesses. Here's our background and motivation. You gotta know your enemy, and the enemy is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. This is a large area of marine debris trapped in the North Pacific Gyre, a large circulating current. The Eastern Garbage Patch specifically is located between Hawaii and California, and has an estimated size of 1.6 million square kilometers, which is more than twice the size of Texas. In the gyre, the vast majority of the trash is microplastics, which is defined as less than five millimeters in size. Much of this comes from larger pieces of plastic breaking down, but not decomposing due to sunlight and erosion in the seawater. It's estimated to contain 80,000 metric tons, which equates to 1.6 trillion individual pieces of trash and it has a density estimated to range between 10 and 100 kilograms per square kilometer. Don't think of it as a big island that you can step on though. The garbage patch is more like a milky soup. Microplastics can pose a big health hazard to ocean wildlife. 
Microplastics floating on the surface can limit sunlight to plankton and algae below, affecting the food web. In addition, fish and sea turtles eat microplastics, mistaking them for food. This just passes higher up the food chain to larger animals like tuna, whales, sharks, and eventually humans. Another issue is that microplastics can absorb toxic chemicals, which we don't want to end up inside of us or the wildlife we eat. Microplastics cleanup is a massively complex, multifaceted issue. So what's our solution to properly collecting and disposing of these microplastics? We'll talk about that next. So we start off with the initial design with fine requirement, low cost, marine friendly, autonomous, self-powered, and low man maintenance design. Initial design we came up with are based on the floating sea bean trash collector already been made out there. We also implement the microplastic filter in our new sea bean. Now, let's talk about terminology. The sea bean work based on the up and down motion between the inner and outer bin. We believe that we can make improvement. We want to take out the pump com component and rely on the wave movement to power our bin. Instead of using mechanical bump, we look for a different source of natural power such as compression spring force and magnetism in our component. The new spring and magnetic component will be placed between our inner and outer bin. With the water flowing in the inner bin, it will weight down the spring and the magnet. Thus, the compression spring and repulsive magnetic force will push the inner bin up again. And then the process repeats. Why this is happening, we have, a, we have one way valve at the bottom of the bin to get excess water outside of the bin, relying on the pressure from up and down motion of the whole mechanism. As time has passed, we've advanced our design to this current concept. We now have a more realized locker design, which is meant to efficiently capture and hold on to microplastics while also keeping larger pieces of debris out with the use of raised guards. Here you will see that as water passes through the top, it will fall through our funnel and into the internal bin, which houses our net lining. The funnel is designed like this, so that in the case of high seas, the locker won't lose its microplastic cargo. Here you will see a close-up of our lockers as well as an exploded view of all the parts that make it work. The magnets and spring you see have all been chosen to get the correct movement pattern for the water to properly escape through one-way valves placed on the holes of the outer bin. In order for the lockers to be effective, we will mount them onto special buoys that will be strategically placed in the Pacific and will drift with the currents through the ocean and the gyre. The buoys will have solar panels on them as well to power a transmitter that will re relay information back to the mainland, such as its GPS position and whether a bin is full or detached. Next, we would like to introduce our autonomous solar-powered water drone named Davy Jones. Upon receiving a message from the buoy that a locker is full, Davy Jones will deploy with a fresh locker and bring it to the buoy utilizing the GPS signal and then return to the mainland with the full locker. Davy Jones will be mainly battery powered and these batteries will be charged by solar panels on the top of Davy Jones. The journey that our drone will take is meant to be more passive so that it isn't invasive to marine life as well as other vessels in the ocean. While this is our final envisioning for Davy Jones, we plan on creating a prototype that is meant for more of a proof of concept. Here we have a small simulation of the process when a drone come and pick up a full locker. Know that here we don't have the buoy attached the fall locker around it, but we just focus on the simulation of the action of picking up the locker. Our sea bin collector will consist of nine parts. The estimated material cost will be $1,074. On the inside of our bin, we have a nylon six 200 micron net. This net is recyclable, water insoluble, and will not contaminate the water or fish with any harmful chemicals. The reasoning for the 200 microns is that it will allow microplastics into the net while the major pieces of plastic get filtered out. The net will go inside of a metal bin that is made of nickel alloy 625. This metal is very durable, low maintenance, and salt water resistant. On the outside of the bin, we have a HDPE tube, which is made of high density polyethylene. HDPE is very durable, buoyant, 
resistant to seawater and UV rays, and has a longevity of about 50 to 100 years. Between our plastic bin and metal bin, we have magnets and springs. The springs will be chrome silicone alloy steel, which will be seawater resistant. The magnet will be a neodymium N42 rare earth magnet. The top of the bin will have a funnel with a check valve to allow bigger plastic trash to be filtered out. There will be a neoprene rubber sheet to cover between the two bins and keep water out. There will be U-bolts to connect the springs to the bottom of the bins. There will be a flotation device around the bin, which would be custom built to accommodate the locker. The valves will be placed on top of the funnel to filter out big trash and on the bottom to filter out water. We will be using check valves. Check valves are one-way valves. They can be manufactured by us or we can use pre-built valves. The Davy Jones drone will be made of HDPE material and will have an engine, claw, solar panels, solar panel covers, and GPS system. The estimated cost of the drone is around $3,500 to $4,000, but is subject to change. The recycled plastics market is a growing market. As of 2020, the market is valued at $39.47 billion US dollars, and it is estimated to reach $54 billion US dollars by the year 2025. There is a great market for recyclable plastics. Companies such as Adidas make an estimated 40% of their clothing with recycled plastics. Nike also uses recycled plastics to make shoelaces and other components of their shoes. Recycled plastics can be used to make many items like reusable cups and tableware, packaging for food, building materials, backpacks, blankets, rugs, and rubber planters. We at Crustacean believe our design is feasible as our cost is relatively low, we have a self-sustaining system, and will be low maintenance. Compared to other solutions for plastic pollution, we have a system that requires little manpower to operate. Many of the other ocean cleanup solutions focus on the big pieces of plastic, but at Crustacean, we want to focus on the microplastics. Microplastics are recyclable ready, unlike large plastic that has to be broken down in order to use. We believe we have a quality solution to the growing problem of microplastic pollution in our oceans. All right, panelists, if you will now um, unmute yourself and turn on your video, that way we can see you and we can proceed into the question and answer. Thank you very much for your presentation and for putting all of that together. It really looked well. All right, so let's start with your questions. The first question is, what is the range of the plastic sizes your systems address? Um, so we have a 200 micron nylon six net on the inside. So that is for two millimeters or less. So that would be the size of the plastics. Okay. So it'll, it'll catch those two millimeter plastic pieces and then any bigger pieces will get filtered out by our system. Okay, perfect. What were your design alternatives? Alternatively, we were thinking, um, at first having a drone that goes out and actually picks up everything and brings it back. But we figured that was, that was too much stress for the one drone. And so we wanted to split up the, uh, the, the different jobs. We felt that it would be uh, a lot more feasible and a lot easier and less stress on each individual. Uh, we also thought of a filter for a washing machine, but again, we thought that the problem is more out there in the ocean already. So it's better to go and attack the problem head on. Okay, great. Your system floats on the surface. Thus, please clarify, is this where most and the bad microplastics reside, either suspended of subsurface or what percentage of the current microplastics uh, is your system intended to address? So, um, for our system, there, there is a good majority of the microplastics on the surface, and that's uh, given that a lot of animals do tend to uh, feed with the surface, we do intend to catch more, and that's where that's why our system is coming in at the surface level. And let me just iterate on what he said. So at the top of our locker, there is like a funnel device, and then there is a fil uh, not a filter, but we have the valve and the valve is supposed to allow smaller microplastics and water in, but keep the big pieces of trash out. 
Okay, great. There are a lot of competitors in the floating bin space. What would you say is your uh, best competitive advantage and how does it compare in cost to similar solutions? So I believe the, all the design made out there using manpower and using electrical component in the system. And what's benefit our system is along is all autonomous and it will use less manpower and everything will be run itself as a whole system. And that will benefit how costs. Yeah, and so the cost of our locker, as we projected, it's around $1,000. I would say it range 1000 to 1500 And that is like a real estimate. Like those are actual materials that we could buy today and make the locker out of. Um, our competitors right now, um, like the Floating Sea Bin Collector is a company. Um, they have an electric powered sea bin collector and it has a vacuum system. And that is estimated around $4,000 just for that sea bin collector. Okay, great. Who is your target customer? And how would you scale your design? Our target customer is uh, bigger companies such as uh, Adidas, for example, or Nike who require, um, um, who require recycled plastics already. And our plan is to sell to them. And given that we are capturing already processed plastic, it would make us more enticing to the company that requires them. And as soon as we have a system running, it will be very easy for us to add more buoy, more locker, and around the sea gyre. So it will just simple as the shown, just come to a different point to pick up the trash and then go back. Okay, great. Another question. How long between buoy replacement or cleaning? So we believe it depends on the amount of trash the locker can pick up, but usually we will set up between two days set for a full buoy to be picked up and a new buoy will be replaced into it. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much for your presentation for all of the hard work that you're doing. Microplastics, as you can see, is a huge problem that we're trying to address. Again, thank you for all of the time and for participating today. We're going to take a break and show you some videos from previous Invent for the Planet while the judges are completing their scoring. And as soon as that's complete, we will come back and announce the winners. For all of you who, are, who have participated, Thank you again so much for everything that you've done and we'll be back momentarily. I have been talking with folks from Romania, I've been talking with Egypt, I've been talking with all these different people and it is just like what y'all are doing. So it is fascinating to see this happen all over the world. We're working on the issue of uh, accumulating flood water. So we're developing some deployable buoys that can help us understand where flood water is going. Our product is a seal tight bag for storage and shipping of rice and grains around the world. So there's uh, a lot of regions that have uh, low access electricity. So what we're going to be doing is providing lamps that are lit up using bioluminescent bacteria. It's organic and powerless. So the problem we're addressing is remote monitoring of waste overflow in dustbins. And the first place team is Illuminite. <laughs> When I was a child, we didn't have electricity. Um, we can, uh, we could only study uh, at night using candles. 
it wasn't easy uh, to study with the candles. Uh, in our country, uh, about 55 percent of the population uh, doesn't have access to electricity. It can affect the education of the country. Uh, we are facing this problem uh, now in real life, so uh, I want to reduce this problem. For our lampshades, we're actually just using water bottles, or soda bottles in this case. We have this removable bottle holder, which case, which also has the LED down here. Each LED actually has its own switch. Since many of the people in Myanmar already have sewing machines with the old trundle system that you pedal with your foot, they could simply sell them just a gearbox that would allow the power to be generated, or they could sell them the gearbox as well as the trundle system so that they can generate the power. So this deals with how you can illuminate maximum space with the minimum amount of electricity. The entire thing comes to a touch under $5 for five students that will last five years. It's very humbling because over 55% of Myanmar actually is in need of lighting source that doesn't directly need electricity from the grid. And so actually working with people who are directly affected by this problem makes you not only more motivated, but more humbled in the same time. Our country is just a developing country. The whole world is changing. The whole world is different from our country. To be a developed country, we need to try more, to think more, to innovate more. I'm very happy to get getting a chance to solve the problem of our country. When uh, we heard that we are invited to go to this country, it is unbelievable for me and yeah, we were really happy. It was the first time on the airplane and, and the first time to leave our country. This will be the thing I, I will never forget. This event is an incredible experience for people to come together from all different kinds of backgrounds, majors, and having all these different ideas and coming together to solve an issue that'll help make a difference and save lives. There's other uh, locations all across the globe that are working on the same problems statements that we're working on. It's really great to start seeing other outside point of views other than my own when it comes to engineering on these problems. Collaboration is really important that I found on projects and engineering. You really realize that you cannot do anything in this world that has an impact uh, if you're trying to do it alone. It's just crazy, like the amount of collaboration that goes on and you're sort of, you know, bouncing ideas off of each other and getting a different cultural standpoint on the same subject. Diversity is really important when it comes to solving a problem. Thinking over the weekend, interacting with all these uh, experts in the field, having mentors, that definitely makes a difference in terms of how we can innovate, how we can improve trying to find a solution to this specific problem or any of the problem statements that we have will definitely make people's lives better in a way that we might not have seen before. It's actually mind boggling to what you can achieve over the weekend. Inland for the Planet is awesome because it solves a lot of problems and it makes the world a better place.
we were excited to come to Texas because um, none of us actually been here. Just knowing Texas a and M's culture, your morals, your traditions is so different to what we have. Being in Texas has been amazing. Uh, your, this is university is so, so cool. <laughs> And people has been really, really nice to us and, and really welcomed us with, a, with a open arms. It was our first time in the U.S. It was a really big deal for us. The event for the planet, it was not only a competition, it was some questions that need a solution. So what I'll remember most would definitely be the teamwork. It's been a really great experience to see how a team that's dedicated and motivated can take a lot of pressure off any one individual when everyone's working together. It kind of shows how diversity is very important in this competition, especially for my group. I believe my group is very diverse in personalities. I think that's why we succeeded. Everyone's need statements are different to ours. So it was nice to see how they solved the problem. So just, yeah, meeting the other team and just talking to them, seeing the idea was probably the best part. We were all brought together for the point of improving quality of life. We saw the potential in it. We saw that it could really change their lives. We come from a country that doesn't have this, this field about so much of research and science. And it's wonderful to see that we, we from Brazil can, can also do research, can also produce content. So people from Europe, people from the United States, and we're here in the middle of them, showing that Brazil can still produce so many, so many good things. The first place winner in this competition is Team Tupac. Again, we hope you've had an opportunity to enjoy some of this previous Invent for the Planet. And this one will, of course, go down into the history books just like the previous ones. It's going to be different because we won't get a chance to celebrate all together. I hope by next year, we're able to bring everyone back together in a physical form and be able to celebrate with each one. What we're going to do now is we're going to introduce the winning teams. And what we'll do is for the first place team, we'll ask the team to join us again. So the third place team is Haya Bioplastics from McCary University. Congratulations. And I wish I had a more than me just being able to clap a wonderful, that's an outstanding presentation, outstanding design, and we do hope you continue and continue on with that particular project because it really has an opportunity to take some of the water hyacinth and now introduce it into it to a very usable substance. Our second place team is Ecotory from Texas A&M University. Again, yay, congratulations. Thank you very much. It's a tremendous effort. Airline waste is a tremendous problem, as you can know, and hopefully you'll continue forward with your opportunity to move this project forward. And you'll have resources available to you to help you move this forward. And last but not least, I don't know what it is about the country of Brazil, but Correas, from Brazil is the winning team. So congratulations. And we're going to ask that team to come uh, on board and to start their video and give us a chance to talk to them and say hello and uh, congratulations. Hello. Congratulations. <laughs> oh Thank my you. gosh, this is outstanding. <laughs> Thank you very much. Y'all had a tremendous presentation and a great job and congratulations, even in this virtual world. 
but we really appreciate it. So tell us a little bit about how you're feeling right now and uh, what your plans are to move this project forward. Oh my God, I can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited. <laughs> Uh, we ha actually, we had uh, an university here. They're a group that makes uh, cleaning on lakes and stuff here in Rio. And they actually contacted us like two months ago about developing a project using our idea. So yeah, we are waiting for this uh, coronavirus to give us a little bit of relief so we can meet and start something. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Anyone else? And tell us more about yeah. what's going on. Yeah, please well, tell us. It's a very good, you're very excited to share with you, you all. Uh, we are thinking about getting into uh, a Whirlpool, that's a company in Brazil that product, uh, that uh, washing machines. And part, we'll try to partner with them. So this is a great start already. We can now have much more credibility to go there and talk to them. Again, congratulations. Samuel, anything from you? Oh, we can't uh, hear you. Oh yeah, Samuel, Samuel doesn't speak English, but ah. we can translate something that he wants yeah. to say to you if you want. Samuel. Uh, Again, I, we don't. I, I don't hear audio. his audio at all. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. I'm so happy to know that you're continuing on and that you are going to continue this project. And I hope the prize money is able to help your project continue on. I want to congratulate you and congratulate all of the teams who have participated in the Invent for the Planet. Again. We'll be doing it in February uh, of 2021. And hopefully by that time, we'll be able to socially get together again. However, we will again obey all of the coronavirus activity and whatever this virus is gonna take and how to keep us apart, it's not going to beat us. Because as you can tell, even though we're having to do things through social distancing and apart and virtually. Teams continue to innovate and teams continue to make tremendous changes. Again, congratulations. This is Rodney Bain with Texas A&M University and we've been the proud hosts of Invent for the Planet. And again, we wanna, con uh, at least acknowledge our sponsors, RS Components, as well as SOCAR AQS, who have been tremendous supporters throughout this past time. We look forward to being able to get together again and look forward to connecting with you in the near future. If we can help you in any way or connect you with any, any other university, please let us know. Again, congratulations and thank you.